thanks for coming. I'm going to start off. I have a lot of content. Um, I'm going to try to get it all in and on time, but uh, a lot of these things I'm sure will spark uh, discussions, and I, I would like that. So if we I'm trying to balance between the discussions and moving on, there's a lot of content here. So if we don't get to it, if you have a question, please just ask me out in the hall. Um, my information is all over here. I can give you my card. You see me on Oracle Technology Network, uh, just reach out. I would love to help you out, answer some questions. I've got a bunch of good friends here who can also help you out. So, so let's make the most of it. Uh, still a seat up here in the middle. Um, so this session, uh, oh, I'm Chris Barberi uh, <laughs> with, uh, with Finit. Um, who's here for the first time for a K-Scope uh, conference? If you, wow, a lot of you. This is not going to be your last time. I, are you having a good time? Yes. I love this. This is my seventh year coming. Um, so this session, uh, we thought about, <clears throat> I wanted to do application reviews. I thought, well, what's interesting, I, I spent a bunch of my time looking at uh, HFM applications, doing system reviews, uh, and I just wanted to show you some of the things that I find, what we look for, and then within that, a lot of statistics that I've been gathering for the last 10 or 12 years, I guess. Um, so we call the session, Leave No Stone Unturned, Secrets to a Successful Application Review. I work with uh, Finite Solutions, like so many of the good partners here that are here this week, we work with the Hyperion product set. Um, <clears throat> just a, it's a great company to work for. And just like so many other partners, we work with, with some really big names. You probably recognize some of those here. Some of you are here. Let me move past the marketing and right into the slide. So I've been working with the product for 18, 19 years, something like that, with the Hyperion products as a customer then as an employee of Hyperion, and then as a consultant. So, uh, And uh, later, if you want to ask me, let's talk about music. I'm a huge music fanatic. Probably, did anybody see the rock opera that I did two years ago at Casco? All right. HFM implementations as a rock opera. I'm not kidding. True, true, I did it. <laughs> you think it's funny. Wait till you see the circus on Thursday. Um, so when we do an application review, first thing that we do is we need to sit down and we need to listen. Uh, I've learned a lot from Rob Sabolsky about sitting and listening and just asking questions. So what we want to go through is I want to talk with the stakeholders, the controller, power users, the administrator, and infrastructure. Every good application review has to look at all of those. The use case, what are you getting out of this? What kind of problems have you had? Uh, when were things last good? And, and it's not to say, I, I've done uh, reviews when the customer loves the system, everything's great, they just, wanna, they just wanna do a check. In fact, I just did one for a company that called it a health check. I went through it and, I, and in that health check I said, your rules rock, your rules are great, your, your application is designed really well, you might think it's a problem, but actually, statistically, it's great. Your infrastructure sucks. We have to change out your service, which I'll show you later. How we actually prove that, it's not nice to mouth off. I'm kind of being a little funny here, but when you're asking somebody to spend a lot of money on new servers, you really need to come bearing fact. Uh, so anyway, when we're doing a review, we want to look for, are there any organizational changes? Acquisitions, divestitures, uh, anybody change their fiscal year? Ever? So it happens. Uh, so all of those things, we have to figure out what's going to happen, what happens with the application we have now. Um, typically in an acquisition, we'll get the question, will this application handle it if we double in size? Uh, and I've been through those. Um, so I'll show you how to measure that. Did you have a question? No, just stretching. Uh, so some system changes. We're gonna go through patch or an upgrade. We're about to do this. We wanna make sure that after we upgrade that performance is as good as possible. It's actually what I just did for a um, customer last month. Uh, so these are questions I need to understand so that I can frame the scope of the, uh, of the review. Um, do you have any recurring problems? Let's talk, about, let's talk about your service requests. The same customer had a service request outstanding since December, severity one. 
since December. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> long, long story, but one rule. One rule was causing a problem was bringing the system down during the production close. Listened to them for a couple of hours. We analyzed it. Anybody ever work with a guy in support named Terry Harbor? If you ever do, there are no better hands than, being, than working with Terry Harbor on HFM. So, uh, so we figured it out, and by the end of that day, I was done, fixed their problem, closed case. Not everything is that easy, but it's nice when it is. Uh, then we want to talk about what your monthly close process is. Do you have any change control? Do you have approvals for the rule changes, report changes, form changes, metadata? Um, do you have distributed versus centralized responsibilities? I still work with companies who their locations will send the, the data files into some central place, and then that administrator will do that. Well, with this product called FDMEE, can I tell you about it? You can push responsibility out to the field, things like that. So gathering all this information, we can find, okay, there are better ways for you to do this. So what are some of the things that we find? What are some of the things that people tell me, tell us? I'm not alone in this, right? <clears throat> um, well, it's slow. It's slow comes up. It doesn't come up because it's always a problem. It comes up because it's the easiest problem to point to, right? So it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like money. You, you look at your bank book and you go, oh, I never have any money. Well, that's the easiest metric, but it's everything that goes into that. So when it comes to it's slow, is it, well, what's slow? Is it the consolidation time? The calculation time? Is it the process? Maybe your consolidation time is great. It only takes half an hour, but it takes you six hours to put everything together to do this, to then look at it, adjust it, allocate it in Excel, and then bring it back in. So that's the, that's the, you have to look at that. So if I look at the servers and go, well, you know, you, I can make this a little faster, that doesn't change an end-to-end -end process problem. The doing allocations in Excel, you know, can we move that into HFM? <clears throat> what would it take? I should do the allocations as part of your consolidation. So it's just an idea. So in addition to its, uh, those ideas, sometimes SmartView, Anybody have a problem with smart view performance? <clears throat> Usually they're big spreadsheets, sometimes they're remote users. Sometimes you're trying to query data when there's something happening in the system. There are always good explanations for it. Sometimes it takes a while to figure it out. But <clears throat> slowness on smart view is an entirely different investigation, investigative path than consolidation time. Navigation. When people upgraded to one, two, three, one, two, four, they complained at first about navigation in the browser. We measure, or we have this perception about slowness. When we click on something, how immediately does it respond? Well, okay, I, it's slow. When I click this, well, okay. Well, that has nothing to do with the servers, but now I know what you're talking about. So we really have to break down what they're talking about so that we can uh, figure it out and fix it. The many steps to the process I mentioned, the offline processes, yeah. My favorite really is, we'll take this out, we'll do the allocation in Excel, we use HS get values to push it back, <clears throat> and then it's a multi-step process that can be fixed. Um, <clears throat> lots of journal entries. That was one, it was a customer that I worked with uh, just north of here, that one of the big complaints was about lots and lots of journal entries. Oh, lots of US dollar journal entries on the foreign currency entities, too. Anybody do that? That was us. Do you, I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> True confessions. <laughs> wow. It's like church. You come up and you can be saved. <laughs> and I think we did. <laughs> But that's really important. Are you doing things to the system? You know, let's stop doing parent currency adjustments. Let's reverse, let's push them back. And then let's talk about what that can do to improve your life working with the application. Uh, this is fun, a lot of data. Well, what does a lot mean? I'll show you. So a lot of this stuff is personal. It's, the, it's my perception. It's your perception. It's just a lot of data, it's a lot of journals. 
So I asked somebody, uh, you know, what's a lot of journals? We probably do 50 a month. Okay, okay, okay. Well, Textron does 400 a month. So, or at least if that, is Mike reading the room? No, I'm in the clear, okay. Textron does like 400 a month. So, you know, you take that, divide it by the number of people who are on the system, and if it's one or two per person, that's not really bad. But if you're talking about a system like Pfizer, who's got 1,000, 1,500 users, UTC, 3,500 users, you can have a lot of journals. Uh, and time consuming to make metadata rules and reports updates each month. This last one on the metadata and the rules, are the rules written in a way to actually minimize your metadata? Uh, I should say, are the rules written in a way so that when you update metadata, you don't have to update the rules? That's a big one. <clears throat> so, which is my next point, is the application designed in a way that makes your process problematic? <clears throat> Did you hard code the rules? You can actually change cash flow to be this dynamic structure, CF underscore the account, and then your rule just says, go read that, take off the CF underscore, take this account, take the change in it. Things like that can make your life much, much easier, and then you don't have to update it. Um, does, the, does your closed process fit with HFM's inherent process? That's, an, that's a long way to ask this question. I worked with um, Pepsi, one of these consumer product companies. And their problem is that Pepsi is a, uh, like other consumer product companies, very product line focused. Well, HFM consolidates up the entity hierarchy, but if, you're, if you have people who are watching uh, Minute Maid and Pepsi and all of the other products worldwide, that's a slight, that's a custom dimension. They want to see their custom consolidated while another product line is asking somebody, is asking South America to reload. Well, South America's data includes the data that the other product manager wants. So they have hundreds and hundreds of concurrent consolidations with kind of conflicting requests. And this is, well, if you had actually put the products in the entity structure, because that's the way HFM thinks, I'm not recommending that, I'm just pointing out their needs conflict with the way HFM is designed. It's not an easy one to solve. Um, uh, eliminations between entities or customs. Uh, the eliminations between customs is tricky. Anybody have to do that? So within a custom hierarchy, it's like within business unit or something, so HFM doesn't lend itself to that. It's possible, mm, but I wouldn't want to do it. Natural versus functional account design. This is classic in manufacturing. You know, what's in your account dimension? The natural accounts, rent, salaries, postage, telephone? Or is it manufacturing, research and development, R&D, uh, SG&A, et cetera? So that, that design tension that we have to go through, that can be difficult. Uh, it, that can lend itself to you spending a lot of time trying to update things, including, this one is a big problem for FDM maps. What gets mapped to the account dimension versus the custom dimension? We have opportunities to decrease your cycle time, improve your stability, reduce your maintenance. And this one, this is a huge value. What are other companies doing? What are other companies, other users like me, what do they do? So we can give you some, uh, some baselines, some statistics, and let's benchmark. <laughs> Before we can find that we're gonna improve some process, we have to know what is it right now. This is, uh, was it Eric, you or Jeff said, this is the Chris Barberi slide. I've been capturing this for a, a decade. I think I've got 115 applications I've studied. You can't read this from back there, but you can absolutely download this. This is up to date on the K-Scope site. <clears throat> so I looked at a bunch of dimensions and I wanted to know what's normal. So of 115 applications, I'm looking at the median and then one standard deviation from that. Statistically, this is normal, somewhere between these two. If the, if the number of members that you have in each dimension fit within here, you're good, it's not a problem. If it's lower than this, great, not a problem. If you're anywhere near this last column, the high, you've got a problem. So this is the danger zone. It's like the Mount Everest. Um, 
Anybody here have more than 75,000 custom members? You're good, okay, good. Because <laughs> I worked on that application. Every single one of these in the high has been in the emergency room. Stay away from that. Uh, so this question, how does your application compare? Well, this is pretty easy. You can, you can just look and you can see how they compare uh, against these statistics. But this question, how much room for growth? Well, that's important. If you have, the entities is pretty common, uh, 700 to 5,000 entities, that's a big spread, but that's normal. If you have eight, 900 entities and you're looking at 500 more and you're wondering, is that a problem? Well, statistically, not a problem. You're still normal. So it might seem to you like, oh my God, we're gonna add 500 entities. Go ahead. We'll test, we'll measure some of the other aspects of that, all right? But if you have 28,000 entities, anybody have more than that? More than 28,000? Yeah, I came in and I'm going to build and they have like 35,000. 35,000 entities? Do they use all four customs? Yes. Oh, wow, okay. Because sometimes, somebody was saying that they had 17,000 accounts but they, don't use, they only use two of the customs. So sometimes you can break that up into other dimensions. Okay, so I'd be willing to add them to my, uh, my hit list. All right, um, so, so some of the suggestions. So now we've, I've gone through the listening process. I've kind of gathered, okay, here are your pain points. Now let's start looking through the application. Um, and that, you know, one easy one is, uh, is to create a master parent. Uh, most applications have a dozen, six, a dozen, 18 different entity hierarchies. Uh, just, just put one master parent above them all. I just call it all entities, then have everybody below that, and then you can just consolidate that and it will consolidate them all together without you uh, having to go one by one by one in task automation or something like that. Easy, very easy to actually stop the data from rolling up to that, because what if somebody ran a P&L against that? <laughs> Holy smokes, we have 35 billion in revenue. Um, so uh, it's very easy in consolidation rules to say, well, you can consolidate up, but don't write any data to this entity. Uh, another one is um, uh, never post adjustments to parent entities. The moment you do that, because you want to post a high level, like divisional kind of adjustment, you are, you are shorting your future of breaking that entity up any time that you post an adjustment or make a parent entity an intercompany partner, i.e. flag North America is ICP, you will never break that up again. You are, that is in the application. And actually making a parent entity is ICP means your, your other hierarchies aren't gonna match because the other hierarchies won't have that parent, probably not, and therefore your eliminations won't work. Please don't do that. There are other problems, but I'll stop there. Uh, avoid parent currency adjustments because of how they flow in the different hierarchies and the maintenance with that. Never flag parents. Remove, oh, do, do remove unnecessary members. If you have entities that you haven't used or, you know, feel free to pair that. Do your spring cleaning. Do your fall cleaning. Get rid of those if you want. But for God's sake, don't remove an entity, uh, currency. Don't remove a currency. Don't rename a currency. Uh, anybody done that? Your calc statuses are broken. You've got to call support. They've got to give you a script. Yeah, that's a fun bug. If you ever get in a situation where your calc statuses aren't updating correctly, you do a consolidation and some of them are still, maybe it says okay, but maybe it says CN, but the number's okay. It's, it's confused. That's a symptom of the bug the currency bug, which I won't go into, and your face might look like this. All right, uh, here's a fun one, overuse of plug accounts. Um, so I'm not calling a Wendy, but uh, <laughs> you know, but just saying. Uh, what if you had an application that you had 23 accounts use the same one plug account? Maybe this wasn't yours. Does it look? Oh, it all right, all right. <laughs> um, but it was just a it was just a good textbook example. Thanks. Uh, so 
blame our predecessors. So what's the, what's the problem with having 23 different accounts use one intercompany plug? Where did the difference come from? I don't know. Any one of those combinations. So please don't do this. Try to, try to keep it small so that you can figure out where the, um, where the, where the out of balance comes from. Another fun one is if you have, if you have um, uh, current assets and current liabilities, you know, AR and AP, your plug account belongs in working capital somewhere, right? Uh, don't, plug your, don't plug your balance sheet into your P&L as like a, an expense. I've seen all, don't cross the beams. Don't cross the statements, my advice. Uh, all right, so, uh, whoa. One of the big issues that I, I see are, are people who struggle with the zero view setting. So the zero view setting is a setting on the scenario dimension. And you're essentially telling HFM and Enterprise before it, if I have a number here, if I have a number in January and I don't input to that cell in February, what does that absent number mean? Right? I'm not going to load something there because I don't want to load a zero. But if I had a number and I don't have a number now, it could mean I have. It could mean I'm zero now on a year-to-date basis, because for actuals we typically load on a year-to-date. So if I have nothing, implicitly it probably means I have zero on a year-to-date basis. If so, HFM will derive a, a negative to get to that year-to-date number. So if I had a thousand in January, I've got nothing now. Therefore, on a periodic basis, I must have negative 1,000 to get there. Inevitably, this comes up because somebody has a report that shows the periodic data, January through December, and then they have like a year-to-date column on the end, and they don't want that reversal to show up. So they'll start loading zeros into that to defeat um, HFM's interpretation. So if you load zero on a periodic basis to that, then that means, oh, the zero is periodic, Therefore, if I have a thousand last month, I have zero periodic. I will have zero. I will have a thousand this month. So you're you're struggling with the way HFM's trying to interpret that for you. And if you if you have rules or Smart View or some other process that loads periodic zeros in, you're fighting with your design. And we should just talk about that. We should talk about do you really need this? Sometimes there are situations where one entity loads periodic and everybody else is year to date. There are exceptions to this where you do have to load some zeros, but for the most part, um, try not to do that. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. You've heard in many sessions the use of a, date of a custom dimension to capture an audit trail, to capture your data from where it comes. We start from the bottom. Uh, typically, you know, we'll, load, we'll load from your general ledger. FTMEE will just load right here. We don't want to touch your numbers from the, your ledger. We want those unspoiled. We can trace those right back. If we needed to make an adjustment to the numbers that wasn't in the ledger, then let's make another member called the general ledger adjustments. If I need somebody to type into a form, then we'll have a member called data entry. Then that way when FTMEE loads, reloads the ledger, it's clearing out only general ledger data, and it's preserving what's in data entry. <clears throat> Different ways that you can do this, FDM's native uh, capability is called data protection. That can do that. Because you don't want to ask somebody to retype a form because you had to reload the ledger. Does anybody have that problem? Yeah? <clears throat> so it's, there's a feature to do that, and there's a way around that. <clears throat> Don't make somebody do rework. What's the feature called? Data, protect, data protection. What's the feature called in FDM okay. and FDMEE? It's okay. been around since 2002, 2003. Thank you so much. Uh, and then Finit has something called Smart Merge. There are ways to actually just replace that one. But if you don't have a data source to mention, it makes it very hard for us to distinguish between the ledger data and the non-ledger data. So, and, it, and the ability to actually capture allocations, various allocations. I like this because when I'm coding an allocation, I know, okay, these are my results. 
And if I have to redo the allocation, I'm just wiping that member and leaving everything else intact. So it's a, it's a very nice layering effect. So then I start looking at the data. This goes back to the question of, I have a lot of data. So what does a lot mean? Well, I, I do a data extract and I wanna see what are we loading into the application? We're loading into the application uh, you know, a certain number of records per month. I take that and I just divide by the number of entities and I come up with an average number of records per entity, a total, and then I look at it by month. I also wanna look at, are we loading zeros? Don't load zeros. It can just expand your database, make you do calculations that you don't really need to do, because zero plus zero or zero times zero is gonna be zero. Uh, so we, we try to analyze, are you loading a lot of zeros, and if so, where do they come from? So let's stop that early in the process. Then we look at the calculated data. You know when you extract data, there's a checkbox that says include calculated. That will pull the data out of every account and custom member, which is flagged, is calculated. So in this case, I wanna see what got loaded. In this case, from the same base entities after the rules have run, I wanna see, all right, how much data do I have now so that I can see incrementally how many records the rules themselves are generating. It tells me a little something. It tells me where the, it tells me what your rules are doing and it tells me if you have some problem that we need to uh, investigate. Then I look at the top entity. Same thing, how many records get up to that one top entity? Uh, same thing, the, how many zeros are in this uh, top entity as a percentage of all the data? Um, if you write your own consolidation rules, if you have uh, in the app setting consolidation rules equals Y, you can have a subroutine that says <clears throat> from this, um, from parent total of my child entity, give me all the records. Any of them that are non-zero, pass them up to my parent. That's a way to suppress zeros. Even if you're in the base entity and you're generating zeros in your calculations or you're loading them, we can still stop them from propagating up the entity tree by in the consolidation rules saying if the value is non-zero, then consolidate. Very easy to do. Um, and then one interesting thing that I look at is in this example, the top entity, let me see if I have it. I, I try to look at um, how many records are in the top entity compared to the average base entity. <clears throat> so it's, it's an interesting metric of efficiency. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that is, if you have, if every entity uses one custom member, you load one record to 10 entities, each entity has one record. If they all load to the same one custom, then your top entity has one record. It's just a bigger number, but it's one record. But if each entity uses a different custom, they have one record, but the top has 10. So you see the spread? If you have custom members or accounts, which are entity specific, we'll get a much bigger spread between the average base entity and the top. That's an efficiency ratio. If you have a highly inefficient application, it's hyper sparse. Uh, that can play into the way that some reports are run, some rules are run. Uh, so it does mean something. In this case, I'm showing you the data. How many, how many records do we load to all of the entities on average. Typical application has about 55,000 records loaded on a monthly basis across all of the entities. After the rules are run, we have 335,000 records. Um, sorry, uh, 55,000 to 252,000. This is the one standard deviation. Takeaway here is this is the range. You can take a look at the chart. If you think you have a lot of records, compare yourself here. Compare your data here. Uh, this is the danger zone. Uh, again, I, I only looked at 24 applications, but it's still pretty interesting. Uh, the, the, where the median is 55,000 records, the danger zone here, it's 1.2 million records. And that's what HFM got. I don't know what FDM processed to compact it down to 1.3 million. You may have hours long FDM processes just to get that data in. Uh, and then if you're loading that many records every single month, well, what happens to your database? 
So let's take a look at your database content. Uh, so if, if we, I don't know where I'm going with this. I just wanted to show another picture of a rock. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the idea I thought, well, you know, now we're looking at the data that we load, and now I want to look at what's behind the scenes, what's in the database, let's start decomposing. Did it work? It didn't work. It was just a pretty picture of a rock, huh? What are we holding on to? What's in the database? So I want to look at what's in the tables themselves. Let's just do a query. I am an accountant, <laughs> like most of you. I am not a DBA. I have friends who are DBAs, and I just asked them for this information. Show me how many records are in every table in the HFM application, uh, and then show me how big that is. <clears throat> so I want to sort this, and this comes out in this nice little Excel sheet, and I can sort it by the number of records, and I can see what these tables are called. Uh, so in this case, um, I've got 3.7 million records that are in a table called HFM error log. Anybody know what that is? It's your system messages. When HFM writes an error, or not even an error, it could be informational. Somebody logged in, somebody did a consolidation. That's not an error. But all of those, in, all of those informational rows are stored in this table. And uh, did anybody tell you when you went to school that you had to purge that table? I don't remember that. I, maybe, I, maybe I was sick that day. Uh, maybe I was at the beach. But um, there's an Oracle, Oracle notice, if you dig deep into the uh, fine detail, the fine print, that uh, you should keep your error table. So there's error log. There's also a task audit. You have no control over task audit. There's no configurability to that. When you calculate, load, consolidate, run a report, run an intercompany matching report, all of that is captured in the task audit. You can't get more or get less, it's just there. So that's another table that's running behind the scenes. You know, when you go into consolidation administration, uh, auditing, task audit, it's reading from that table. Again, Oracle recommends that this table be kept to around 500,000 rows or less. Uh, but Oracle, up until recently, didn't give us any mechanism to manage that. A lot of infrastructure consultants, or if you're a DBA and you know how to write a stored procedure, you can do this and it can archive that. I don't know how to do it. I know who to ask. <laughs> uh, PFLOW, if you use process management extensively, every time that you um, submit, review, approve, add a comment, those are captured in a table, one single table called PFLOW. So that can actually get pretty big. So the task audit, and if you, this example doesn't have data audit, <clears throat> but task audit, data audit, PFLOW, and the error messages are all tables that are, that are prime suspects for database growth that you're not even aware of. In fact, it was this error log table and the corresponding HSV event log text file that the rule file, remember I told you I fixed a rule, and that rule file was causing a lot, like a high volume, hundreds of thousands of messages in the logs that was making that file grow so large, the whole system became unstable. <clears throat> so these are symptoms behind the scenes that you're, you wouldn't look at, you have no way to see, but we're looking for it. Uh, so what else is in the database? I just talked about the logs. I probably should have listed those in the previous slide, but then I thought, you know, what's interesting is uh, every, the, the data tables, we can look at the data tables, we can see the various scenarios, and we can see the various years. And I just did a pivot table, and I grabbed the size of the table by scenario and by year, and then a really cool feature that I like in Excel is that um, the color coding, the top whatever, from green to red. It's cool because I'm a very visual person, so it, uh, it, it made me see some things. It made me see these things. So we have forecast. Well, when I did this, the current year was 2012. And no one really thought or looked back like, does anybody need 2006's plan? <laughs> Probably not. So when we looked at that, we said, oh, 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 I didn't even know it was there. So. This is a good thing to go through. 
uh, the pivot table was easy to pull together. We analyzed this and we got rid of some stuff. <clears throat> um, I had another application that they had years in like, they had some data just in 2020. No one knew it. It was like an actual in 2020. And uh, turns out when we looked at it, we looked at what cells were in there. Oh, Joe over in FPNA was just, he thought he had his own little sandbox of time period that nobody else was looking for. Aha, so we caught Joe, <laughs> told him to stop loading data into the future. Is having data in a year, in a year by itself can slow you down, like if you have data all the way back in uh, So Keith just asked, is having data in a year, is having data in general impact the performance? Is that part of it? Is it a problem in any way? So I put here in red, which you can't see. Da okay. Database yeah. size matters most for backup and restore times. Okay. So to answer your question, when you're consolidating, if you're consolidating in 2012, well, you're probably reading 2011's data for your opening balances, and you might be impacting 2013. So let's just say we're dealing with three years when we're dealing with that, it means we're reading that, we're modifying it, we're writing it back. These other tables are sitting idle. Nothing is happening to them. They have no effect whatsoever on consolidation time. It's a great question, and I get that all the time. Uh, so the fact that your database is large isn't really a problem. It's not a factor in consolidation time. But it is a factor in backup and restore times. So if your database is really, really big, I've seen where it's four or five hours every night that the system has slowed down because your database is doing a backup. Oh my God, what kind of a database takes four or five hours to back up? So a massive one. I've seen half terabyte databases. I've seen terabyte databases. They are in the emergency room. Uh, some of it has to do with a high volume of scenarios, a lot of years, but some of it has to do with a lot of applications. So you have companies, some big companies like Johnson Controls, UTC, there are other companies. You inherently have multiple applications because your business units are larger than most other companies. Each business unit, well, and you guys do at Coke, right? Each business unit has its own application, makes all the sense in the world. They're probably all stored in one central place, which is fine, but as a result, your database can be really big. I highly recommend that you not pollute your production environment with backup copies or tests or training. Don't do that because what you're doing is you're, you're just telling the system by making a copy, you're causing your system to take longer doing that backup. Anybody ever had a tragic event where you had to do a restore? Database restore? Okay, couple? Or you're just not saying so. <laughs> it's, it's tough. And if somebody tells you that restore is gonna take, in one customer's case, that restore took nine hours. Nine hours, because database is massive and you have to restore the entire database. You can't just, res well you, you can, it's complicated to restore one application, but in general you have to restore the entire database and then you have to use the copy app to take the one application that you want and copy it into the other one and it, it's dicey. Keep your database as, as lean, as small as possible. While the database is being backed up, the whole system does slow down because the database is busy getting copied and, all right? That answer it? Um, so, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. If you were in my session the other, yesterday, it was just yesterday, about, uh, this week is a blast. Um, yesterday I was talking about benchmarking and looking at rules, so I'm just gonna repeat a little bit from yesterday, is, uh, is benchmarking the application, the calculation times. Um, so I wanna see how long does this thing take to consolidate? And in order to do that, we pick a point of view, and uh, typically I'll do a whole year, unless it's gonna take me 12 hours, then I'll just do a month, but I'd like to do a whole year, consolidate all with data, and I'll run that three times. 
uh, because each time can actually have a different result. So I want to take the fastest of those three runs, and then I also want to look at how big a difference it is from the first to the second to the third run. Typically, it's 20 to 30% faster the second time. That has to do with caching and something on the infrastructure. Um, so, uh, so, as you can say, so I consolidate three times. My baseline is the fastest of those three runs. Then I blank out the rules. You take subcalculate, you take everything out of it. So it says subcalculate, nothing, and sub. Then you take subtranslate, do the same thing. I usually leave subconsolidate alone or I'll just write a standard consolidation routine. Most times subconsolidate doesn't take that much time to run, so I don't worry about it. But, it, but when I take subcalculate out, here I had subcalculate and translate in, here I don't. This should be a lot faster. How much faster? If I take the fastest run from this and divide it by the fastest one, I call this the blank rules test. If I blank out my rules, how fast is it going to be? That ratio of, of uh, the full rules to the blank rules is called the rules impact ratio. And uh, you know what's normal? Oh, I'll show you in a second. Um, and this is, this is just the explanation I just gave you. Subcalculate typically takes 80% of your total consolidation time. Subtranslate is 2 to 5%. And subconsolidate is 5 to 15% of your time, just if you ever, and it does vary a little bit, but that's pretty normal. Um, you can do, what I've learned recently, and I learned from uh, the guys at Accelitus, is uh, if you just do one month, usually that's enough to reveal the problems in your rules. Uh, but sometimes we have rules that execute in quarters that don't execute in months, so. But if your rules are consistent and are not month specific, then you can do this. Uh, and you would typically find two to three of your rules are taking 80% of that 80%. Those are the ones we wanna find. Um, so how do we find those rules? Well, there's a few different ways to do it. What we wanna find is that time we want to find which rules, we want to find time, how much time are they taking. Uh, we can use the right to file. If, uh, if anybody saw my presentation last year on debugging, I go through that. I think it's available on the Case Scope site. If not, you can send me an email and I'll send you the presentation on how to set up and, and do some debugging using right to file. <clears throat> We can do that and we can generate um, some information that we can analyze using Excel or there's a product called Excelitis. They're downstairs in the exhibit hall. You can check it out. They have a product called the Rules Profiler. And really recently in 11.124, Hyperion, uh, the Oracle has released something called a Rules Profiler or in, that's part of Insights. I haven't played with it yet. Anybody play with it? Does, have you seen what actually gives you the individual rules and not just subcalculate, translate, and consolidate? Do you get the subroutines? Yeah, you get the subroutines and they, yeah. so, um, excuse me, time to host in milliseconds and, and also that's made up well, by entities, so it seems quite nice actually, so. Okay. Really something, uh, work, get, get it, okay. So, uh, so, Prasad, who's the lead engineer for HFM, told me that it's there, I just, very busy on a project and haven't had a chance to look into it. So thank you. Uh, did you do you have that in your blog? Yeah. The, so it's uh, Henry. Mm -hmm. What's your blog? The uh, Finnish guy. The Finnish Hyperion guy. The Finnish Hyperion yeah. guy. It's a really great <laughs> blog. <laughs> it, it is. It is good. A lot of us read it. Maybe you're not. It is good. So uh, if you want to check it out, um, so he talks about a lot of the new features. Did you know you had fans on the other side of the earth? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> um, so those are ways to find out who are those t top two or three. So I want to say, well, what's normal? What's normal for calculation time? I'm also watching my time here. Um, so I looked at 30 different applications for this study. And, uh, and I wanted to, in order to level set, because every application can have a very different number of entities, in order to come up with one standard metric, I take the total, the fastest consolidation time, as I mentioned before, 
I divide it by the number of periods that are encompassed by that consolidation, and then I divide by the number of entities that are encompassed in that. So now I have the calc time per entity. Now that's not subcalculate, that's the whole consolidation time just simply divided by the number of entities. The number of total descendants, which could include entities repeating because the time for them to roll up to multiple parents has to be accounted for too. So calc time per entity, per period. So the, the average, the median, is half a second. Every entity takes about half a second. The range is between half a second and 2.2 seconds. Out of 30 applications, that's pretty consistent. So you can go home and you can, you can do this on your own. It's pretty easy. Because um, all you have to do is consolidate all with data. You don't have to do a right to file. Just look at your system messages or your task audit. Write down a piece of paper, because I'm old school, or you could do it in Excel. And just calculate the elapsed time and do the division I mentioned. Half a second to two and a half seconds. If you have a blank rules file, meaning there's no subcalculator translate, um, it, it does translate, by the way. It does use default translation. I should have said that. Was that clear? <laughs> it still does translate. It just doesn't use your special translation. So the blank rules, uh, one-tenth of a second, it, it's 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. Uh, so the high that I've seen so far is 6.2 seconds per entity or 0.7 seconds per entity for the blank rules. Um, and then the impact ratio that I, that I said before is somewhere between 8 and 23. So there's a big range of, as you can imagine, of how many, of how intense, how extensive your calculations are. That's what the impact ratio is. How much do these rules impact my app? So two questions. One, are the numbers you've got up there pre-124 or under 124? Um, so the question about which version it is really doesn't matter to some degree because they're relative. Well, but the, the, the absolute part. numbers yeah. matter a bit. So yes, I, now I see your point. The impact ratio, sorry, right. the impact ratio is relative. Right. These are absolute, and I'll show you in a second. Okay, and the other, the other question was, with the impact ratio, would you expect it to be consistent between old versions and new? Does the impact ratio, is it the same between old and new versions? Yes, it varies a lot by your hardware. Um, so, uh, so I'll show you that in a second. Um, and then the cube size, because everybody wants to know, well, these must have taken longer because they have more data. Uh, well, not really. Um, so didn't I have a chart? I think I have a chart later on this. Uh, so I, I showed you a chart with the circles. That's the, uh, I think it's in two slides. We'll see, I've forgotten. Let me answer your other question though about the infrastructure and then come back to the, what's the relationship between them? So, oh, back here. If your rules impact ratio is, eight to 23, the higher your impact ratio is, the more we need to look at your rules as a candidate for improvement. I just did an application review where the customer's impact ratio is like four. And uh, you know, this is a classic question where the system is slow and IT says, well, it's your application. Our stuff is great. Uh, you know, it's not. Actually, your rules impact ratio is four. It's one of the lowest I've ever seen. It is not your rules. And then I thought, well, this customer who is 57, absolutely, we, we won't talk another second with the infrastructure people until we fix your rules. 57 times. So, so how do we measure that? I take a standard application. I took a real customer application. It's none of you here, you're all okay. I took a real application and I, I sanitized it. I renamed all the metadata members. You won't know who it is. I took every single data value, changes to the number one. But the rules are legit. The sparsity of data, the number of records in each entity is perfectly legit, which is what I needed as a metric, as a baseline. And this is the finite performance reference application. So, so if you take one application, the same application, and you run it in lots of different environments, if the app is the same, what shakes out is environmental difference. So I'm not looking at your application yet, I'm looking at this, which is a study of your environment. I do a data load, the green bar, uh, sorry, the blue bar is how long it takes to load data. That's a measure of your database performance. Uh, the red bar is the full rules file for this application. The green bar is um, the blank rules. 
that was really squirrely. Why do their blank rules take longer than the regular rules? This happened because something happened on the server while we were testing it, virtual servers. It's like when your neighbor gets loud, when your neighbor, you know, the other virtual server in your environment starts to get really busy, it does impact you. That one aside, um, and what I do is I track whether it's virtual or physical, what version it's on, and what you can't see back there is there's virtual and physical spread throughout here. In fact, some of the fastest environments are virtual. Anybody surprised? You're surprised. Nobody else? Physical was always faster. I always thought physical was faster, but what's happened is, uh, what, what really happens is, well, virtual is inherently slower because it's got overhead. It just has to do with how people are building them out. So they get some nice, fast hardware. We're all, as a community, learning a lot more about VMware and virtual tuning. So between that and some of these, yeah, some of these hardware, the, the virtual servers are running fast processors. Some of the physical servers, in order to keep costs down, are going with run-of-the-mill hardware which is slower, <laughs> and that's what I found here. So, um, so I'm no longer on the it has to be physical bandwagon. I have proof. Virtual is just fine as long as you treat it well. Um, uh, what was I going to say? <clears throat> uh, 11.124 is typically 50 to 60% faster than 11.123, which you've heard. You've heard from me. You've heard from Oracle. Uh, Jason, you guys, you guys like knocked it out of the park. Six times fast? I mean, it was like hundreds of percentage fast. Yeah. So 11124, much, much faster. Consistently, and those are all the applications up here, those are the results up here. Uh, oh, just a couple of anecdotes. In um, the orange, so I had this. We, uh, we changed some of the power settings in Windows from balance or power saving mode to high performance mode and re-ran it, and their consolidation time was cut by more than half. You won't always get that. I was kind of surprised that it was just that. But it was basically something throttling back their, their CPUs in the, in the interest of keeping your servers running lower power mode, I guess. Um, so that was great. That usually doesn't happen, though. In this case, with the blue, we had a customer who upgraded from uh, an older server. They were in that four or five year cycle, whatever, to, to retire the servers. And they went from uh, 2.5 gigahertz processors to 3.2 gigahertz, and they cut their time 65%. Same application, they didn't make any changes, they just put it on new hardware. Hardware does make a difference. It can make a difference. But I wouldn't spend my time on the hardware until I made sure that my application wasn't the problem, right? So here's that chart that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the size of the circle is the volume of data in every entity. The, this axis is the seconds per entity per period. This axis is the rules impact ratio. So uh, you can see lots of different circle sizes here. So the volume of data really doesn't matter. Anybody surprised by that? No? You are? Okay, nodding heads over here, good. Yeah, so even though we go in this whole tirade about zeros and data loads and all that, which don't, don't let your guard down to keep the zeros out, but in the end, it's not really that big a deal. It's your rules and your hardware that are the two biggest factors. So uh, I, I think yesterday showed that these uh, circles out here, we had one rule that we changed and we moved their calc time down to here. So very sensitive. And then I showed you before, by changing out the hardware that we cut 65%. So it tells us, these, these tests tell us where to spend our time. If you're, if you're way down here on, your, on your, um, that generic performance app, then we probably need to look at your hardware. If you're way out here, on the, on the rules, we need to look at your rules. And certainly we could look at both. But they're independent tests that tell us how to spend our effort. All right, so I had a customer last month that their, their rules impact ratio, they were down here. So we're not talking anymore about your application. 
and then their, their performance was middle of the road, which you'd think wouldn't be a problem, but they told all the users that the new version was gonna be so much faster, but they used the same exact hardware they had in the old version, 11.1.2.1 to 11.1.2.3. They couldn't move to 11.1.2.4. Um, so, let me see, long, calc long calculation times and a low impact ratio uh, equals slow app server. So you have to combine the two tests. But over here, a high impact ratio and a below average generic consolidation time, this tells me your servers are great. Your application's the problem. Does that have any questions about this? It's pretty revealing, it's, and it's not hard to do. Um, so just a couple more things. Uh, keeping up to date, I had to decode this 11, 1, 2, 1, 600, 1, 2, 6. There's a PSE patch set exception, patch set update, patch set product version. It's a whole table about when do we upgrade? When do we apply patches? Because patches can improve performance. They can break perfectly legitimate features. <laughs> All hail the regression. <laughs> um, but you really should keep aware that Oracle does release a patch set update every three months, six months, something like that. Just keep on top of this. You don't want to go five years in between patching. I don't think you should. Uh, and then when we finish up the analysis, so remember, we started with the business case. Always start with the business case. What are they doing? What are the things that bother you? How can we solve those? What's in the metadata? Any problems with the design? And then we went into one of my favorite areas, which is the infrastructure and testing the data, the calculation times, and then figuring out where do we go from here. We write this all up. Uh, do really focus on functional. The infrastructure, unless you're an infrastructure expert, can get you into places that they can be uncomfortable situations. If you're pointing to people, don't do that. Do, do let's, let's look at the application. Um, and, then, uh, and then prioritize for actionable changes. Again, telling somebody that they need, you know, eight new servers that are 3.2 gigahertz each, it's not an easy thing to do. Changing some rules Sometimes changing the rules is not an easy thing to do either, so we just have to be careful about it. Uh, I think yesterday in the rules, uh, tips and tricks, I showed you one rule. Well, that was easy. It took me like half an hour to change that. Had no effect, uh, no effect in the data, and had a massive effect in the application, so you have to assess each one, and that was a huge improvement. Whew, I think I'm done. Wow, three minutes to go. Uh, rock on. Anybody know where this is? Oh, I guess I... Anybody been to Acadia National Park in Maine? Yeah. Beautiful place. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I have one question. You mentioned that uh, um, like you have all entities on top. Yeah. Yeah, and you said that you can, is that an attribute to make sure to know um, no data? No, it's, so the question is, uh, on one of the slides I created a master parent called all entities, and I said from from my mistakes in the past, I said, you can't let data consolidate into that or somebody's gonna run a report on that. In subconsolidate, you add a condition to that that says if the parent is not all entities, then consolidate. It's that simple. I can give you an example, if you catch up with me later, but it's really that simple. Uh, and, then as, and then as a result, that entity gets a status which is okay, but it has no data in it because you don't want somebody to see it. You can secure it too, but an administrator can still see that, and you don't want the administrator to make that mistake. Also, that top entity could have a lot of data in it and, and take 10 minutes to calculate. Yeah. Just one last question related to changes to the metadata that means that you may change the metadata and historical implication, and you don't want to have too many of those applications. Yeah. So, so the question. Do you have a year when you do? This, this is a classic question about archiving yeah. and about you want to see, you want to have an application before significant changes. Um, so you, everybody's running out of the room now. Let me, you can hang out and talk. Thank you all very much. Please fill out the, uh, the cards. <laughs>